Amen. Thank you, Jeff and Jen. We love you guys. Um, I was thinking as you were talking about serving, Jeff, that there was a time uh, where I calculated it out that I'm pretty sure you set up about 100,000 chairs at this, at this church. It was like every Sunday for decades. And so you have a servant's heart. And you, you used to say when a pastor tells you you have a servant's heart, it means they're recruiting you to set up chairs. But you, you have a servant's heart. Um, hey, we're going to do um, that thing that we always do. I love this. We're going to open up God's word and we're going to say, oh, Father, would you speak to us? Would you be the loudest voice? Would I, to your point, become smaller? And would you be loud and strong in the room? So if you have a Bible, why don't you meet me in Ephesians chapter 5? And if you're able um, and desire to, would you just stand with me in reverence of God's word? And we're we're going to dive deep into it. This is Ephesians 5. Uh, We're going to be reading verses 17 through 25. Ephesians 5, 17 through 25. Here we go. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this is where we'll be today. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Family, this is where I'm going to be this morning. Look at me. My goal this morning is to lift up and honor and exalt the high and amazing calling of what it means to be a woman, okay? I want to give incredible dignity to this amazing creation that God has called the daughters of the father and the brides of the groom. It is my hope that if you're a woman in this room that you will leave this place today feeling like, oh, God treasures me and has a high calling for me. All right, and I'm also going to delve into this sensitive, sometimes misunder- often misunderstood, often abused word called submission. Um, and it is my heart, my goal, that, that as we leave today, uh, we will have a biblical understanding of something that is amazing and God-focused, okay? So I need to pray because, uh, first of all, I feel a little emotionally tired, physically sick. I'm like snotting and coughing all over everything, so just like, stay away from me. But, but this is like a sensitive, beautiful, amazing text, and we need God. Lord, would you, would you now do what only you can do? Would you invade and empower and rest on us and by your Spirit illuminate your Word so that we would hear from you, not from me, so that we would hear from you and feast at the table of the King of Kings. We love you. Do this by the power of your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, so why don't you open up to Genesis, uh, page 2 of your Bible. Um, If you were with us this last week, um, we began by giving this awesome vision of, of God creating the world and then saying, I've got a crowning glory for my creation. I want to create human beings in my image. And if you were with us last week, you remember that the word image is something like impression. Like he he formed, stuck his hands in the dirt and formed this uh, clay-like being, breathed into it, put his very handprint upon it, if you will. And the impression of God is in the, is in the very soul of men and women. And, and like the plight of mankind is we try to fill that God impression with anything else, okay? You're meant to be filled by your creator, okay? And then not only does it mean impression, but it means reflection. He said, I want to form 
human beings that will reflect the very nature of God, that will be like a mirror reflecting God to the world. And so he's like creating all these things. He's like, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he created man. And what did he say? It's not good yet. Okay? It's not good yet. Because it was in his heart right from the very beginning to form a woman so that man and woman together would reflect the image of God. And so, and so Genesis 2.18 uh, Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. I want you to underline those words, helper fit. If you're taking notes, I want you to go with me into these words, helper fit. That word helper um, uh, in the Hebrew language is the word ezer, okay? E-Z-E-R, ezer, okay? It's the word ezer, and this Actually, a brilliant woman um, Bible teacher. Her name is Betsy Killens, and she she was staying with Ashley and I a couple weekends ago, and she just opened my eyes to all this biblical depth that I didn't even realize was there. And so I just want to share with you some of the things she shared with me. Okay, Azar is used 21 times throughout the Old Testament. Okay, two of them for women, three of them for military alliances. And 16 times it's used for God. Okay, Azair means something like helper or strong helper. It's a word of just strength and honor, okay? Like David said, the Lord is my Azair. The Lord's my helper. This isn't like a subservient word. This isn't a secondary word. This isn't like I formed Adam. Hey, buddy, you okay? Or you need someone to like help you? No, this is strong helper, Okay, used in military terms for like you would not be able to win this war that you're in without this warrior battle companion by your side. The word ezer. Okay, you got that? Ezer. Uh, the word fit is the word konegdo. Okay, which means counterpart. Okay, it means like like. Well, I'm going to show you exactly. So if you're taking notes, why don't you look up at the slide? I want to show you just in Hebrew kind of a, a breakdown of these words. Ezer konegdo, okay? It means a corresponding strength, like a strength and a corresponding strength that need each other to be at war, if you will. It means an essential counterpart, like something fit, like, like, like it's essential it's not good to be alone. You need an essential counterpart. And then finally, it means an indispensable companion, okay? Uh, allow me to use an architecture illustration, okay? Because I don't ever use architecture illustrations. Here we go. Um, in the world of architecture, I didn't know this, but, but uh, especially in the building of cathedrals, there was a moment that was the absolute game changer in architectural world, and that is when somebody discovered the flying buttress. All right, here's what that means. Okay, before that, when you're building cathedrals, like the walls could only go to a certain height because all the weight, all the pressure was in the walls. The walls had to be very, very thick. You couldn't really even have windows. It was like, it was like shorter walls like very thick walls, but when they discovered the flying buttress, which is they would take these two arches and put it together, and together they would bear the strength of each other and bear the weight, and the two arches made it so that the walls could actually go higher, stronger, thinner, windows. Suddenly, cathedrals could have height. It could have strength. It could have light. It could have beauty because the flying buttresses were these corresponding strengths, essential counterparts, indispensable companions. When I am wanting to romance my wife, I look her in the eyes and I tell her, you are my flying buttress. <laughs> Maybe a different line would work better. But, but that is what this, this vision of what marriage is supposed to be, okay? A man, Adam, a man, the, and we're going to talk about this a lot next week too, with a corresponding strength, essential counterpart, incredibly, incredibly valuable. There's not a hint in these words of subservient, secondary, lesser value, or anything, okay? These are the daughters of the God of the universe. And as we'll see today, the, the brides of the groom. And God loves his daughters, these bold, strong, beautiful women of the living God, Okay? Ezer Kanegdo. Now, with that kind of in the background, let's go. Uh, 
let's go to Ephesians. So, so flip over to Ephesians. Um, I'm sorry, wait, wait, I, I missed the part. Let me, let me make sure I get this before I go. Remember, I'm sick and weary. And Chapter 2, verse 21 through 33. He didn't just like dig his hands in the dirt and like form a woman, but here's what he said. Verse 21 through 23. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, remember last week? I said, I said in Genesis, you even have this literary grammatical structure in chapter two that's kind of like boom, fact, 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 fact. And then God says, not good yet, forms a deep sleep, takes a rib, forms a woman, brings her to the man. And when he did in this moment, the literary structure in Genesis changed. And this man begins to sing, okay? And he sings out the poetic song. This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is my indispensable counterpart companion who together we will image forth God. Okay, and that's why Matthew Henry said this quote. This is a famous, if, you, if you've never heard the, the name Matthew Henry, he's kind of like this famous old commentator. Uh, Matthew Henry's commentaries have been around forever. This is what he said. I think it's beautiful. He said, Eve was not taken from Adam's head that she should rule over him, nor from his feet to be trampled underfoot, but she was taken from his side that she might be his equal. From under his arm that she might be protected by him, near his heart that he might cherish and love her. All right? That's beautiful to me. So with that kind of in the background, um, God gives us some sacred callings. Okay? Sacred roles, sacred callings. Okay, so flip to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start with 18 through 21. I preached for a month on this paragraph that sounds strange to you. That's kind of how we roll around Antioch. Um, the spirit-filled life, I said, this is the burning center of the, of the book. Like, we're not meant to do life alone in your own power, in your own strength, producing your own patience by, like, getting more patient. Like, you can do it, buddy. That's not how the Christian life works. You yield, submit, surrender, empowered, spirit of God producing patience through you that you could never do in your own strength. All right? We're meant to live spirit-filled lives, and we're meant to be a spirit-filled church, okay? And in that, there's some indicators of what the spirit-filled life looks like, okay? Here's the indicators, ready? Singing, uh, where does it say this? Addressing one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart. Giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 21, important, watch this. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another like a mutual submission. So now I want to define this word submission, okay? This is important. It's going to be a definition that builds a little bit. Here's the first part, ready? Something like respect, but a super respect, like an amped up respect, like a high respect, honor, and trust, Okay? Uh, high respect, honor, and trust. And watch this. I mean, we're supposed to submit to each other, all right? Like followers of Jesus, you are meant to submit to one another. We're supposed to honor each other and respect each other and kind of lift each other up. We're supposed to show a super respect to one another, husbands and wives, you are meant to submit to one another or to be looking to honor and respect and uplift and like, what are your desires? What are your yearnings? What are your, like, what, what do you think is best? I want to honor you, trust you, respect you. It's not, I'm the guy. Don't I get to play a man card here? No, no, no. Please hear this. Spirit of life. I am submitting all the time, all the time to Ashley trying to find out how to honor and respect and love and trust her and doing actions that would flow with that. So I could give you 48 illustrations, but let me just pick a couple. Um, I know many of you in the crowd are super animal people. 
Like, I love you. I know you love dogs and cats, and it's awesome. I see, like, I see the value in it. I am not a super animal person, like the, you know, barking, whatever. I mean, I, I liked it. But, but so all throughout our lives, like, Ashley is like, can we get a dog? Can we get a dog? We got these, like, cycles of dogs, cats. Do you think I ever win, like, ever? Of course not. It's like, like, she wins every single time. So, so, um, um, like here's a great example. Um, we had at one point in our house two dogs, and our dog Izzy got pregnant and had seven puppies, which we set up a kitty pool outside of our bedroom door for the seven puppies and the two other dogs. And uh, we also had a cat that also in that same exact time had seven kittens which were in the garage. And so me, who I told you is not that much of an animal person, at one point in our life, like literally counted 17 animals living in our house because she is my flying buttress. <laughs> like, like, like I submit to her, makes her happy, and I love that. And ultimately I learned to love what she loves, okay? We could pick a zillion other examples of, of her saying, in this decision, what would honor you and respect? Because that's what I want to do. What would honor you and respect? Because that's what I want to do. And it's like, like, as we honor and respect and love each other, that happens. We mutually submit to one another, okay? Now, where was this submission first shown to us? Okay, this is important. A lot of people miss this. In the Trinity, Okay? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, equal in value and aw like awesome in roles. You're not going to subservient one of the members of the Trinity. They're three in one. And yet on earth, you need to know that Jesus very clearly said, I'm submitting to you, Father. I'm like I'm honored, trusting you, looking to you, respecting to you, even in the Garden of Gethsemane when he is on his knees saying, I don't want to do this. Like, is there any other way? Like, like, can this cup be taken from me? And remember what Jesus said? Yet, Father, I submit to you, not my will, but yours be done. I am going to say, I honor, respect, and trust you. I submit. Jesus ascends to heaven. The Spirit of God is within us. And the Holy Spirit's role is often just saying, let's figure out how to honor, respect, trust, point to Jesus by, by filling and empowering and gifting in all ways so that the church and people are honoring, respecting, submitting to Jesus, okay? Submission is this honoring, strong, incredible thing, all right? Jesus shows us that, all right? And we want to be Jesus-like. Can I get an amen to that? Thank you. That was not loud and strong like I was having. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that, um, with that vision of equal in value and corresponding strength, ladies in the room, can I, can I speak to you a little bit? Do you trust me to hand handle like a sensitive, tender topic, which we're going to talk about what it doesn't mean. We're going to talk about a godly vision of what this does mean, that there is a unique role, like a unique, strong calling that God gives you to, okay? And I'm going to talk about husbands, and I'm going to talk about wives, I'm just setting it up, okay? So verse 22 through 25, I'm going to read it, then I'm going to talk to the guys, then I'm going to talk to the ladies, and next week, we're going to crush it with the guys, okay? So don't, come back next week. Verse 22 through 25, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25, here's where we're going to go first. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, guys, I need you to look at me. Every guy in the room, you have an unbelievably high, holy, incredible calling, okay? And it's this. They were in this culture where the status of women was low. Women were considered subservient. Like ancient world biblical times, it was like man and woman and you serve women. And Jesus, who has been called the greatest liberator of women ever, and Paul, who is speaking in the sort of vein and avenue of Jesus, does what Jesus would do tipped the cultural tables over and said, husbands, you 
love your wives. And the word that he used is the word agape, which if you're familiar with the Bible, it means something like this sacrificial, serving, fierce, forever, loyal, down on knees, washing feet, laying your life down in love for another person, Jesus kind of love, all right? We're going to look at that profoundly next week. It's a Jesus kind of love. Men, here's your calling. You get a focal point. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Meaning, guys, we are meant to be a display of the love of Jesus to the church, to our wives. Guys, we are meant to, like, image out the love of Jesus to a woman in your wife that God has called your wife. We're meant to love her like Jesus loves you. And I want you to be thinking about this all week because we're going to crush this next week. How does Jesus love people? And how did he show his love to people? Like, how did he serve? How did he forgive? How did he seek righteousness? How did he, like, care? How did he, how did he pursue all those things? And I'm going to look you in the eyes and say, men, we are called to love our wives like that, to display Jesus to her. And single women in the room, here's, a, here's just one. I'm just going to touch this and I'm going to leave it. Don't you sell out and compromise for some guy that loves himself more than Jesus and says things like, I want to make you happy and we'll be happy and blah, blah, blah. That's all marriage is. It's just like your own self-centered punk. You... Don't compromise until you have a guy that says, I am going, I'm not going to do this perfectly, but I will make it the intent of my life to love you like Jesus loves me. All right? You don't sell out. All right? And let me tell you this, ladies in the room, there is not a guy in this room that doesn't feel totally inadequate and totally like I could never do that. Like that is such a high standard and I fall so short. Okay. And there is one person in my life that can help me, bless me, raise me to uh, help me with that responsibility that what I'm called to do. And that is my wife, Ashley. Okay. I have been given a sacred calling and that's to image Jesus, okay? So let me just kind of keep unpacking that just a little bit, okay? The calling for husbands is to look like Jesus. Now, wives, you've been given an incredible calling too, okay? And I'm going to keep sort of tethering out this definition of submission. Okay, remember I said honor, respect, trust. Um, wives, it says, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, let's talk about the word Submit. Um, in the original Greek language, it's the word hupotasso. It's a military term. And it's a military term which means this. There's a critical aspect to this. It means to honor and respect and trust a leader who has a responsibility to which he will have to give an account for. Okay. Like an officer who knows he has to report to a higher authority. And to submit means I'm going to respect, honor, follow, trust him in such a way knowing that one day he's going to give an account for how he led, for, for how he lived out the calling that he was given. Okay? So let me give you just, you know, another place where submit is used just so we can understand this is Hebrews 13, 17. Okay, this is talking about church leaders, like elders, pastors, deacons, this is church leaders. Watch this. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, watch this, as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So here's what this means. One day, like, David Newman and Sean Bevan in the back and Mark Roser and Kevin Hawley and Jeff Snyder and others in this room, you know what we're going to have to do? This is very biblical, ready? We're going to stand before the living God of the universe and he's going to say, let's give an account of Antioch. Was this a church that like 
pursued me. It was faithful to my word and sought the fullness of my spirit and sought to make disciples and live out the mission on this earth. Let's talk about my bride called Antioch. This text is saying you live in such a way that you don't make your leaders groan. Like you don't gossip and criticize and they cut their knees off and do it. You live in such a way before your leaders that you can honor and respect and trust them so that, that they're allowed to do this responsibility that they will one day stand and give an account for. And when they do, when you can treat your church leaders like that, they'll be like, oh, thank you. I love, which by the way, let me just say this just in case anybody doesn't know this loudly and boldly. Oh, I love this church. And we as church leaders love this church. We just feel like you do. Like, not that we don't, you know, I've been here 20 years now. Not that there's little hiccups because every family has their own little drama. But we feel trusted and loved and respected. Like, we got this, like, one day that's going to be a fun moment before the throne of God because God is doing awesome things through this church, and we love it, okay? How do you be a wife, back to Ephesians? How do you be a wife that knows that one day I will give an account before God of the Newman family, did I love and serve and discipline and correct and guide and seek towards righteousness? And I need, above all things, my essential counterpart, my ezer connecto, to stand with me and help me in this responsibility of this calling that I've been given. That's what it means to submit, okay? Let me give you an illustration, okay? Because this is where it gets really critical, ladies. Um, to submit, to honor, respect, follow, Next phrase, you're given a focal point, as to the Lord. Meaning, meaning this, please don't miss this. Uh, if you take your, your iPhone or your whatever phone you have, and you want to take a picture, sometimes you'll take a picture and there will be a person in front and a person or a background or whatever in back. And you can kind of focus on the person in front and the background in back will fade. Or you can hold up your phone. My boys taught me this. You can kind of tap the screen of in back and the person in front will fade and the focus will come on the person in back. Does that make sense? Here's what this text says. If you have this high and holy calling of being a wife, you look beyond your husband and you focus unto the Lord. You show honor, respect, and trust and let him fade and focus to the Lord. You, this is so important, ready? You let your groom fade and you focus on the groom. You treat him in such a way that your kids and your grandkids and people in your life would say, I think I understand like honor, respect, and trust because the way that you treat dad is the most respectful person in your life. You honor him and respect him in such a way that, that your friends would say there's something different about the way she speaks to him, how she honors and respects and trusts him. Why? Because you're fading past him and you're looking to the Lord. You treat him the way you would treat the Lord. Don't you ever join one of those whining, criticizing coffee groups where ladies get together and whine and moan and dump their baggage about their husband out. Don't you do that. You speak about him. You respect him. You love him. You trust him in such a way that everyone's like, wow. The way she treats him is honorable and respectful. And it's not just him because sometimes, frankly, guys, like sometimes we do things where we're, we are not worthy of respect, where we lose our trust, where we mess up, and there's complexity and forgiveness and brokenness and wholeness that happens in marriage. But we are called, just like guys are called to image Jesus, we're called to look past the guy's wives and look unto the Lord. And let me just give some caveats because there's a, there's a bunch here. Let me just clarify. Um, women, you're not called to submit to all men. You're not. You're, you're only called to have this special focus towards your husband. Um, there's all kinds of complex situations. If your husband is trying to lead you or your family in a way away from the Lord, like, like a sinful direction, 
Or like, what if your husband's like, hey, babe, we don't need to go to church anymore. Let's just sleep in on Sundays. We'll be happier. That's what God would want. Like, there, there are complex situations where I would just say this with, with a whole bunch of, like, needs to be conversations around this. Um, your first groom is the eternal groom. Your father is the father, and first you're supposed to submit to him over, over your husband. And there will be moments where, where in, a, in a complex and somehow honoring, respecting way, you're going to communicate, I'm following the Lord when righteousness is crossed. Um, and I will say this. Um, I say this tenderly and with uh, heartache, okay? Statistically, in the room right now and in our church, uh, many of you um, are abused, oppressed, in some way abandoned. Um, in this word, submission, I want you to hear this. You're a daughter of God. You are a groom of the king. And this word submission is not meant to be a word to trap you in any way. Okay, there are times when, when relationships uh, need such special, special care and wholeness and fixing, and and there's just and all I would want to say in this situation is we are meant as the body of Christ, as the church, to help. And I don't know if you realize this, but we have so many counseling resources to help equip you for those complex decisions. But you are not meant to be in a situation where you are abandoned, abused. Um, are trapped, okay? Husbands have a call to look like Jesus. Wives have a call to look to Jesus and to treat their husband as they would treat the Lord. Okay, so I just want to get real practical, and then we're going to have a sweet communion, a sweet uh, testimony time. It's going to be awesome. Okay, I just want to talk for a little bit about how Ashley and I make decisions. Can I just let you into our lives a little bit? Like, here's husband and wife, um, how we make decisions. We've been married 25 years. We have a great marriage. It is so far from a perfect marriage, but it's a great marriage. We are deeply, passionately in love, okay? Here's how we make decisions, and I think, I think it's pretty healthy. 99% of the time, and I am not exaggerating that percentage, like literally 99 out of 100 times, on all the normal decisions of life, like, where should we go for dinner? What should we do tonight? What should we buy this kid for Christmas? Like all, all these kind of decisions. We try to figure out what the other person wants. And we just like honor, respect, trust, and even lean in and like whatever is on your heart, I would rather that be and let's just kind of make it happen because we just honor and trust and respect each other. It's like this submission that's happening back and forth. It's just a, it's just a beautiful thing, Okay. If one person in a marriage is always like stubbornly saying, this is what I want and this is what happens, it's not a healthy marriage. It is submitting to one another, okay? Sometimes in life, there's, there's bigger decisions, and here's what Ashley and I do, okay? We spend time apart. Like we say, we need some time alone. We seek the Lord. We seek his heart. We try to work to a place where... Uh, we both feel at peace. Like, like even if we don't fully understand or fully, there's a certain peacefulness that our hearts are united. Um, I want you to know this. I want you to know this vulnerably, okay? Um, I've had many interactions, even these last couple of weeks, where I don't think it's become clear to me that people have not realized this, okay? Ashley and I argue and there are times in our life when we argue, what we do is we, like, get our hearts right before the Lord, come back, try, we try again, we try again, we try again. There have been times in our life where we've been at these sticking points where we're not getting this worked out. And please don't miss this. We seek help outside of our marriage of somebody to kind of help intervene with this argument or somebody to give us a little bit of counsel in this argument. There have been, I don't know how many times in our life where we've had to have somebody come sit with us, like we both respect this thing. Will you give us some perspective? Because we're not getting it together, okay? There have been a couple times, and this has been rare, but a couple times where it's like our hearts have sort of grown distant and cold and we're like, 
we're not going to keep following this path. So we're going to get some help to bring us back together. It's not the abnormal, screwed up marriages that need counseling from time to time. It's the normal marriages, okay? And if you don't, then you kind of live in this facade land of like, like well, we have conflict, let's just shelve it. And like, that's when things get unhealthy really quick. Okay? Sometimes it's God's redeeming, beautiful grace to allow things to emerge so that those issues can be worked out, so that, so that you can go through the hard grind of working something out to bring wholeness and shalom to a marriage. Okay? That's what God wants for every marriage in this room, because He wants it to look like Jesus. All right? He wants it to look like the love of Jesus. Um, I want you to know this. Um, there have been several times where I've sought the Lord and I feel like God is saying, Ash, I think God is calling our church or our family or our marriage or direction to do something and she hasn't been quite there yet. And so she has sought the Lord sought, and have come to me and said, David, I, I don't perfectly understand this, but I want you to know something that I know, something I've always known in our marriage. She's like, and yet I'm with you. I'll follow you as you follow the Lord. And if God's saying, give that generous gift to, to this person, or God's saying, we, I think we need to like take this crazy mission trip that doesn't make sense. Or if God is saying, hey, we might even, this has happened twice in our life, we might even, like God is calling us to a crazy different calling in life. Ashley has said, whether my heart gets there or not, I trust you as you trust the Lord, okay? And I want you to know that, that the greatest, like literally most husband's heart alive thing that Ashley can possibly say to me, it's so sacred and beautiful in our marriage, is as you're following the Lord, I want you to know above all things I'm with you. Like, like, I will trust you as you trust the Lord. I'll follow you as you follow the Lord. And in this mutual submission, lean into each other. Ezer egeno, walk hand in hand, submitting to each other. I know that she has this sacred client. Not because it's lesser value or lesser equal, for goodness sakes. Not even close to that. But she gets this sacred, beautiful calling of looking to the Lord and how she respects me, and I know she's with me. Does that make sense? Lord, would you help us do this? Would you help us be a submissive church with submissive marriages, seeking wholeness and beauty? We need you to do what only you can do, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to bring up a couple that God has used in awesome ways in our community. And they're going to share a testimony. Um, so I'm going to bring up my friends Dan Daniel and Rachel Sachs. Um, Daniel and Rachel, as they're coming up here, uh, they are used in this ministry by God um, called the Marriage School. Okay, and I'm not sure if some of you are aware of this or not, but they run a ministry. It's in Lebanon. Um, and many couples in our church like have been a part of their ministry throughout the years. Okay, and they're going to tell you a little bit about it, but mostly I wanted to start, um, mostly, first of all, I just like you guys a lot. I think you're, you're awesome people. Um, thank you. Thank you. They like me too. That's good. And uh, Daniel and Rachel, we've, we've recently become friends. We've prayed with them a lot. We've been in, you know, out in our prayer barn interceding for the city and for marriages in the city with them. And we've just seen God use them in neat ways. And the Lord uses them in this topic of another step outside of marriage to help couples find wholeness. And so would you guys just uh, share with us um, a little bit about your story and, um, and particularly what we've been talking about this morning, like how God has taught you guys um, in marriage. So go ahead. Okay, is it on? Yes. Hello. Thank you for having us. Yeah. So beautiful to hear God's design for marriage. And such a rude wake-up call when we're actually married and it doesn't work out that way. <laughs> but um, I think that's actually also part of his design. So 
I was born and raised in Oklahoma, and I was raised in a church, a very ultra-conservative fundamentalist church where um, we learned that women were not as good as men. We were, women were to submit to all men because they're not as good, not as smart. And um, <clears throat> when I was in college, I, I, was try I wanted to follow the Lord. I wanted to please God, so I was trying to swallow it. But I was in college. I was in the pastor's house, and his wife was making him a cup of tea, and he was just putting her down over and over and over again, just verbally very disrespectful. And then he looked at me, and he said, yeah, and that's because she has to submit to me. And that was the end for me. Now, there were a lot of other things going on in my life, but that's the point at which I said, I'm out of here. And so I left the church. I left. I, don't, I didn't have a genuine faith, but I was a church attender. And I, um, I wandered off to do my own thing, pursue my own career, and I didn't want a part of that. But um, the Lord found me, and I realized that he was a God of love, and that didn't represent him. I gave my life to the Lord, and uh, Jesus was my everything. I was really just looking for Jesus and a dog. I thought that would be enough for me. Why a dog? Why is it always a dog? Come on, David. <laughs> Ashley and I have a secret that that's why you need us. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> instead I found Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> And it was such a romantic story. We, we were both, the Lord had saved us out of so much brokenness. And we thought, man, we've got Jesus. Now I found the right man. Now it's just going to be a coast downhill from here. Everything should be great. Because the hardest thing is to find the right one, right? <laughs> well, a week after our honeymoon, we started fighting and we could not stop. And we were miserable. And... That is how the Lord led us to the marriage school. But I'm going to give you a turn. Wow. Yeah. That was a different turn there. <laughs> the dog. <laughs> okay. <I> mean, <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, yeah, we got married. And, yeah, I, exactly. We thought this was going to be easy, following the Lord. And, but what happened was in that, in that one flesh situation, <laughs> Uh, all of our brokenness, you know, started surfacing very quickly. That was still there. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because it's, you know, we have Jesus and we love him and we follow him. And, I mean, I was super excited when I got saved. I mean, the joy and the power and all that and uh, the peace. And yet, I didn't know what was still buried there from out of my childhood um, yeah, just, just being human and sinful and, um, you know, that all came out for us in marriage and I think it comes out in every marriage because you can't avoid it. Um, <clears throat> and, um, so, uh, why the Lord called us into marriage ministry, that's a question that I will ask him, uh, you know, in heaven, but, um, because it's been such a struggle for us and it's been dif a difficult journey for us. Uh, and we just needed to ask for a lot of help. We needed to seek help and, um, you know, we're still in a battle. It's a battle. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm tempted to hope that, you know, there's a, there's, there's a cruising, you know, a cruise uh, moment, you know, where we have, where we arrive and we can just, cruise uh, for the rest of our lives and it's going to be just wonderful and and I've given up on that because it's just not true so so uh, you know the battle never ends we have an enemy who comes at us yeah uh, we have uh, we have flesh we have brokenness and uh, the fight will not end uh, otherwise it's just naive or we're stalling or we're just avoiding or we're just stuck yeah and um, so I know that we're committed um, though it's sometimes quite frankly wearisome, <laughs> uh, to, to push into what the Lord has for us, uh, in the battle with other people. And one of the biggest enemies for, for any marriage is isolation to fight mm -hmm. on our own. 
Um, I think that's hard for men to, to reach out. It was hard for me uh, because I can do it and I can try one more time and 20 more times and I've got this. And the fact is, I don't, I, I don't. <laughs> and um, so, so we are surrounded by community, safe people uh, that we trust, um, that we can work through things, who battle with us and work with us. And we want to be that for other people. That's what we love about what we're doing, because we see couples change in front of our eyes, being, being transformed and, uh, by the power of the gospel. Uh, and that's wonderful. It's super exciting to see, and to see what God's doing in our relationship, too. One of the, it's funny, I, so I grew up in this rather, op, I'm going to say oppressive culture, but um, where all the women wore jumpers and kids, you know what I'm talking about? And um, No idea. No? Okay, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> and um, you would think that I know how to respect a man but I didn't. And so when we got married, one of our first big challenges was I was strong-willed and I had been independent for a long time. And uh, Daniel was always upset because I was disrespecting him. And I didn't even know it. So when we first came to the marriage school, the, the first week, the first lesson is on respect, building a climate of respect for both spouses. But it was so practical, and there's no Christianese. It's just skills, and so I didn't have any. Um, I didn't have any triggers, you know, Bible triggers. That was important for me personally, and exercises. Just do this, do this, do this. It was so practical. So Daniel, it gave us a language. Daniel could tell me what it was. What 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 it was that I did that was disrespectful. So slowly, I learned how to show respect. And I'm still learning. But I have come a long way, baby. Yes, I have. <laughs> so um, I think what we learned, um, we've been there for 13 years since our twins were babies. And after the first year, it, we knew we had arrived. Now we've got it. Now our marriage is transformed. But um, as we've continued at the marriage school, we realized that there are times when, even though we know the rules really well, and we have the tools that we've learned at the marriage school, when my heart gets hard or I get offended, um, I throw down my tools and I pick up my weapons. Yeah. And so the marriage school is incomplete. It's an amazing, amazing uh, resource, but we all we we just need Jesus because we need heart transformation. And so I think that's what marriage is teaching us more than anything is that there's no set of skills that you you say that there's no set of skills that will make Jesus um, unnecessary and His work on the cross. So, um, yeah. That's what the Lord is teaching us. Yeah. 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 Anything you want to add, Daniel, or is that? I love that, by the way, the throw down your tools and pick up your weapons. Yeah. I want to throw down my weapons and pick up the tools. Hey, would you, Daniel, would you share just details of marriage school? Like if somebody wants to be a part of it in this church, like? Yeah. So uh, we have two locations. We're in, in Lebanon at Lebanon Presbyterian Church, and those, is, those are two host churches. And then the uh, um, Thursday is uh, at uh, Montgomery Community Church, uh, also online on Thursdays, 6.30 to 8.30. Um, it's uh, jump in any time, uh, any week. It's an open meeting. Uh, there's no graduation ceremony because you don't graduate uh, in marriage until you know what day you're done with your marriage. So we're not going to talk about that anymore. Right, yeah. yeah, when you're going when you're going under. So, um, and um, so couples stay for we encourage for at least six months. Uh, some stay longer um, because of that. You know, we're the slow. We we do the slow work, the slow, steady, ongoing work that we all need to grow and to get traction, 
confidence because it takes two and I need to do my part. We need to do our part together. So, um, yeah. Thank you. And for some of you in this room, I think the best step you could possibly and the most loving thing you could say to your spouse would be, let's try it. Like, let's just, let's just try it. Um, I think God is going to use uh, you guys in neat ways to bring wholeness. Hey, worship team, would you come on up? Uh, we're going to close with communion, and we're going to close with just a, a special song where we're going to pray God's blessing over us. And as they're coming up, would you, Daniel, would you just, would you pray for the marriages of our church and just for, just for God's presence to be in our church in a special way? Father, um, we thank you for marriage. Yeah. We thank you that, um, Lord, it's really about you. It's a reflection of who you are. And we get to participate in that. Thank you for your grace, Lord, in marriage. Thank you that you are faithfulness, that you are faithful 100%. When things are not going well, when there is brokenness, you are still faithful. You're a covenant God. You have given us a covenant, and yeah. you will empower us and heal us and change us and transform us yeah. to that same faithfulness, Lord. So I thank you that there's always hope in that. There's always hope in the faithful one. Yeah. So Lord, I just pray that you would speak to all of us, minister to us by your spirit, Lord. Give hope, give encouragement, give, give courage yeah. to step up, step in, yeah. act, do, speak as you would lead, Lord God. And I just pray, uh, just by your spirit, Lord, in the power of Jesus, Lord, in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Hey, they're going to be out in the hallway afterwards and would love to just connect with any of you. Um, as Danny was praying, he said, uh, the covenant that you gave us, covenant of marriage. And it's a covenant that's modeled after another covenant. Um, Jesus said, I'm going to give you a forever promise. Um, and his body was broken and his blood was shed. And through his brokenness and his shed blood, we can find, we can find wholeness. Um, the greatest way to find love is to lay your life down. That's marriage counsel number one. The greatest way to find love is to lay your life down for another. And Jesus did that for us. Um, I want you to take communion to remember that. Um, for some of you, I want you to be reflecting. Uh, God may want to, like, stir something up in you, convict you of an area where you're off of his heart. Uh, maybe make a new commitment to your spouse. I don't know what it is. Commune with the Lord. And then if you're a follower of Jesus, when the moment's right, take communion to remember and to recommit to him. And we're going to stand and we're going to sing about the blessing of the Lord. So, Jesus, meet us now in communion. Teach us, speak to us. Let us commune with you. Thank you for your body and your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Moments right, take communion, and then we'll close in worship.